If you're visiting with us today, this will seem an odd sermon to you. It's the ending of a series with some pretty bizarre content. I hope that what you see here in the end of this sermon is that we are people who take very seriously God's word as the standard for how we live. And that this is not an easy endeavor to do it. But that we and our thoughts and our feelings are not our ultimate authority. It is God's word lived out rightly in our lives. We are uh, concluding a sermon series called By Design, which is an attempt to look at biblical uh, gender and sexuality as described in the Bible. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who's an evangelist in uh, San Luis Obispo, uh, California this week, and he said, you guys are doing what? I have not had courage to address this topic yet. And I thought, hey man, that's pretty cool that we're doing this, you know? Uh, this has been a launching point, a beginning point. This is the conclusion of the beginning yeah. of a conversation that we are trying to have with each other and with our community about how to rightly talk about, understand, and then communicate on these topics and issues. This has not been perfect. This is not um, conclusive. You may leave here today feeling like I'm not even sure uh, where I'm landing on this yet. And I'm here to tell you that's okay. This is the beginning. And that's what our whole intention was from the beginning, is that this would be a starting point. Amen, church? That's to the people who are visiting today. For the rest of you. As we finish this series, I feel like some of you, and maybe many of you, will be disappointed. You may feel you didn't get the definitive answers you were looking for in a series like this, or the, one of the topics that we talked about that you were most looking forward to was not covered well or thoroughly enough. And so what I just said to our first time guests is what you need to be reminded of today. This series is not a purely intellectual exercise. We're looking at a topic and studying a series that requires something of you after today. Yeah. It requires your repentance, and it requires mine. If you leave here today disappointed with the church, yet with no clear action step for you, you are failing Jesus. This series is a discussion about our faith and what our faith teaches and informs us as a community. If you leave here disappointed today, it means that you are only doing an intellectual exercise. It means that you and I can be more like the Pharisees and like Jesus. And yes, I'm talking to you today. I know oftentimes I talk to us and we, because it softens the blow a little bit. But I want you to know that I'm talking to you today. This has been a challenging series for us as a staff to embark upon. Uh, we didn't know which direction it would go. We added lessons along the way because we felt like we needed them. And we don't feel like that at the end of it all, we have done it justice, but it's a good beginning. Um, I, I really want to remind you of this, and I think it's important that we have to agree on the authority of Scripture. And if this series in any way has caused us to question the authority of Scripture, what does that say about us? Or maybe more importantly, why would that be that we would struggle with that? Is your authority Scripture? Or is your authority you? Or is it something else entirely? Maybe that's your takeaway from today. Like, gosh, I thought it was scripture, but I really struggle with this, so what do I do with that? I think that's a good question. I think that's a good thing to leave with. The unexamined faith is not worth living. 
You are not supposed to come in these doors, check your brain at the table, walk in, sit down, and just listen and leave, accepting whatever is said from the pulpit. You're meant to wrestle with these things. It's not easy. Jesus never said it would be easy to live the life that he's called us to. So today, you need to walk out of here with something. And it's not information. You need to walk out of here clear on what it is that I need to repent of. Are we clear on that? Let us begin. You should be suspicious of theologians who tell you that you cannot understand the Bible. It's an old preacher joke that people in this country don't have a problem with the Greek. They have a problem with the English. <laughs> Scripture was written and letters were written, especially in the New Testament time, to be read publicly to a fairly uneducated audience. We, as Armin talked about last week so eloquently, need to do proper justice to the understanding of that scripture by understanding the context and giving proper hermeneutics and exegesis to everything that we read. That takes effort on our part. However, it's interesting that we don't struggle with the biblical ethic of do not murder, or we don't question that so much. Well, let me go back and really understand the original language to make sure they meant what they said. Or maybe it is okay sometimes. And then when we have lists of biblical ethics joined together, read aloud to a congregation, that we might pick one or two that we think, well, I don't know about that. When that happens, we have to stop and ask ourselves a question. What's going on with me? Why doesn't this sit well with me? And by the way, I don't think it should all sit well with you. I was a philosophy student in junior college when I studied the Bible. And I recognized at that time that God's standard for my life will always call me higher than my own. And so if I am the standard, if I am the authority in my own life, my life will not work out, it will fail, I will drive off a cliff, in my relationships, in my work, because I'm the standard. God's standard will always call you higher, and that's not easy. One of the things I'm walking away with from the series is I've, I really no longer feel no obligation to legislate or control or prescribe how anyone else lives their life whose intention is not to follow Jesus. By and large, that's none of my business. And Armin talked about it in the series. Paul told the church, you need to look out for you. You are the biggest stumbling block. Not the people outside the church. They haven't agreed to this lifestyle. But you have. And so what we're going to do today is just answer the question. Is Jesus, of, is, is Jesus exclusive? And I think you already know the answer to this. Because you know the basic requirements of being a disciple are give up everything, go anywhere, and do anything for the sake of the gospel. Is Jesus exclusive? Jesus is offensively exclusive. And the issues that we're talking about that pertain to our world today are how exclusive is Jesus? Because nobody wants to be excluded. Nobody wants to be the last one picked on the team, on the playground. And when that happens, how we feel about that matters. And when that happens, what we want to do as a result matters. And we need to sit with that, brothers and sisters, as a church. And we need to remind ourselves that the road is narrow. 
and difficult. The question is, how narrow and how difficult is it? What about your money? Is Jesus exclusive when he talks about the rich? How hard it is to get into heaven? Do you have a hard time looking at a rich person and saying, you may not be going to heaven? Why? Because of your bank account? That seems kind of exclusive. Or what about justice? How God feels when justice is not exercised? God is just. That lack of justice will keep people out of heaven. Is Jesus exclusive? How about how we treat the poor? Our attitude to those around us in our community. Is Jesus exclusive? I dare say yes. But I imagine one of the topics that I've brought up at this point has probably rubbed you the wrong way a little bit. It might not be the money issue because you don't have any. <laughs> the Powerball thing didn't work out for you this week, and I'm sorry about that. But when I say justice, you might cringe. Or when I say justice, you might stand up and cheer. But when I ask the last time you gave your offering was, well, that's between me and God. You see how this works? All of us have our things that are difficult. So when we talk about this thing that we're talking about in this series, it's difficult. And it's going to become, I think, more and more difficult. Now, what do we do with all this? Open your Bibles to John chapter 4. We're going to look at three interactions Jesus had today. And we're going to look at his method for dealing with the kind of challenges that we're talking about in this series. Are you guys ready for this? Let's pray, and then we're going to jump into John chapter 4, and I'm going to put on my reading glasses. Now you're blurry, but, the, but, the, but the, the words will be clear. This is good. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this time to be together. Thank you so much for what you're teaching us. Thank you, God, for calling us out of our comfort zone and into the radical life and love of Jesus. Help us to respond today. Help us not to be critical today. Help us to be humble today. Let us look at Jesus with fresh eyes and see what he sees and do what he does because we call ourselves his disciples. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 4, verse 1. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came down to some, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? What does Jesus see? What do you see? If you were a first century person, what you would see is a Jewish man talking to a Samaritan woman, which was borderline controversial. This doesn't happen. But Jesus does it. Jesus, the Jesus you see, about to be depicted at Christmas as dressed in white, pure and clean, was tired, sweaty, worn out from the long journey, sits down comfortably at the well and starts talking to a woman he has no business culturally talking to. You can imagine if someone looked, they might think, what's he doing with her? How inappropriate. Who does he think he is? Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am the Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? This woman's uncomfortable with Jesus. She knows this is not the norm. She knows that this isn't right or good or okay. So she goes ahead and brings it up. Like, just save me the embarrassment, buddy. Because everyone's going to talk. And they would have good reason to talk 
as we're about to find out. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. It's a whole nother sermon that we don't have time for today. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. and The well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? As did also his sons and his flocks and his herd. Jesus answered, everybody who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water. So I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. You ever get dehydrated? Here in old New Mexico, you know how it feels. You ever go for a run and forget your water? The ensuing headache that lasts the next 12 hours is lesson enough that you will never do that again. This woman hears about this living water and she's like, I could go for some like automatic drip system in my own body that I'd never have to go get water again. That sounds really, really great. Jesus told her, verse 16, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. Even for today's standards, this is a little bit loosey-goosey, a little bit promiscuous. And Jesus calls it out. Sir, the woman replied, I can see that you're a prophet. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. So much good stuff in this scripture that we don't have time for. Down in verse 25, the woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why do you talk to her? What did the disciples see? They saw a woman. They saw a Samaritan woman. That's all they saw. What did Jesus see? Jesus saw a person that has had five husbands and is now living with somebody else. What do you imagine this woman must have faced in life to end up in this place? Even if her life was great, up until the first husband, and then the second husband, and then the third husband. Are you following me? What is this woman's life like? Why does Jesus lean into her when it was so inappropriate, when it was so controversial? Why did he do it? This woman, in a heartbeat, becomes one of the most fruitful figures in the Bible. She's so blown away by who Jesus is. She immediately goes, you can read the rest of the story later, back to her hometown and says, come meet a man who told me everything I've ever done. In one conversation, Jesus knows her. Everything about her. And the things that he knows about her are not flattering. They're disgusting. So why does he talk to her? When the disciples come on the scene, they see a Samaritan woman. Jesus sees something different. What is the Jesus method? Jesus draws near to people who by culture standards are unworthy, disgusting people. That's what Jesus does. 
and, and he calls them to change. Let's read another story. You guys want to do that together? Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. You might have heard of it. A guy named Matthew. Jesus went on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. I don't have time to get into all this, but that wasn't a good thing in the culture that they were a part of. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Matthew got up and followed him while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house. What is Jesus doing? Jesus is constantly inviting himself over for dinner. You want to be like Jesus? Do you? I don't know. Come on. That's what he's doing. Many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples, and his disciples were embarrassed and ashamed, and they're whispering to Jesus in his ear, can we get out of here? This is not who we should be around. These aren't good people, Jesus. Don't you know what you're doing, Jesus? Come on, you're going to get a bad reputation. You're supposed to be a rabbi. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, let me ask you something. What did the people see when they saw Matthew? The tax collector. That's what they saw. That's all they saw. They didn't see a man. They didn't see a man with dreams and fears and family, with difficulties and griefs. They saw a tax collector. And because they saw a tax collector, they wanted nothing to do with him. The least of which was to go to his house for dinner and hang out with all his friends. They were tax collectors. What do you see when you look at the scripture? You know what you see? You see the beginning of an apostle. Isn't that interesting? Because what the Pharisees saw was a tax collector, a sinner, someone to avoid. But Jesus has to remind them, no, 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 no. This is why I've come. This is not to be avoided. You are not to be embarrassed. Let me show you my way. Draw near to them. Understand them. Get to know them. Call for repentance. Last week, Armin did a very adequate job, I'd say, reminding us of the truth of the gospel. I want to remind us of the grace of the gospel. Let's look at another scripture. John chapter 8. Again, he appeared in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group. And they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. I don't even know what that means. In the law, Moses commanded us to kill such women. Now, what do you say? Maybe a better question was, now, what do you see, Jesus, as this naked, terrified woman who is just committing adultery, stands before all of us, men. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time 
The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now. Eve, your life of sin. What was the Jesus method? Drawing near to the sinner and calling for change. Let's evaluate these two things. Draw near, call for repentance. Draw near, call for repentance. Jesus does both. The gospel message requires both. The gospel message falls apart and disintegrates in your very hand the moment you do one without the other. If all you do is draw near without calling people to a standard, the gospel message disintegrates. And if all you do is shout from the rooftops, repent or perish, and draw near to nobody, the gospel disintegrates. You know this is true on campus. You've seen that guy preaching. He's out there by the fountain calling people names, telling them they're going to hell. We had a guy like that back at Cal Poly back in the day. And I sat there one day and just watched him. And one of my philosophy professors came and sat next to me. And I said, Ken, what do you think of this? And he looked at me and said, Josh, I think he misses the heart of Jesus. I thought that was a profound answer from a philosophy professor, most of whom are atheists. Imagine a gay couple today walked through these doors, holding hands, genuinely, genuinely looking for God. Would they find him here? I am not confident. I don't think they would get far enough out of the parking lot before the looks of being offended because of what we see instead of what Jesus sees wouldn't even allow them to come through the doors. And if you disagree with me and you feel differently about yourself, praise God. But I'm telling you what I think. I want to be that place. I want to be the place where, where people get offended is by the gospel. Not the looks of the people in the parking lot. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not down on everyone. <laughs> I'm just taking an honest investment and in saying, you better leave here today with something, brother. Yeah. And it better not be, why well, I wish they talked more about this. Being heterosexual ain't getting you to heaven. But being self-righteous will get you to hell. Real quick. So, what do we do with all this? I want to talk to specifically some people in the church right now. I love this scripture. 
The time approached for him to be taken up to heaven. Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem and he sent messengers ahead, went to a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? These guys are feeling themselves right here. Are you with me? They're like full of the Holy Spirit. They're with Jesus. They're like, hey, do you want us to just, just torch these people right here? They are disrespecting you, Jesus. <laughs> They've got like Jedi powers, you know, and they don't know how to use them yet. What is Jesus' response to that? He rebukes them. No, you're missing the point. We have people in our church who struggle with the issues that we've talked about over the course of this series. Same-sex attraction. Um, we have people in our church who have children who struggle with the world that they live in and how to find themselves in it. What is my identity? What is my sexuality? We have our children being told at younger and younger ages, now elementary school, that they need to figure these things out. We wouldn't even give them a driver's license yet. But they need to figure out their sexuality. As if any of us could do that at that age. Okay. When your children struggle, it is hard. When your children come back from church camp crying instead of being inspired to study the Bible because of how they've been treated, Or come home from church and say, Mommy, Daddy, I don't want to go back there because so-and-so said such and such. And they haven't come since. If you're like me, when you hear that, and it's your child, you know what you want to do? Burn them all. <laughs> I'm driving up to that camp, and I'm going to talk to somebody. And let me tell you something. As an evangelist, I've got some authority. So I've got some street cred amongst all you. And I can come in there and be like, let me tell you what. I remember when my son, my older son, who's not here so I can talk about him, uh, once again got his track shoes before a track meet, didn't take him to school. Once again, I mean, it was the hundredth time. And I was so mad. And I said, today is the day he's going to learn. I'm not bringing his shoes to him. I just happened to have lunch that day with John Nittafan and Jeff Koontz. And I said, guys, this happened again. And I know you have older kids, so you've probably gone through this. And let me just tell you what I'm thinking of doing. I'm drawing a line. The kid's going to suffer. He's going to go out there in his uniform, with his black socks and his loafers, and run in that race. And John and Jeff looked at me and go, bro, you, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Don't do that. Your son needs to learn the lesson, but that's not how you want to do it. I've made so many mistakes as a parent I've hurt my kids so much, un, un, unmeaningly. I mean, I, met, I had every good intention that day to teach him a lesson in front of all of his friends and everybody watching. Yeah, that would have been good. Burn them all. Brothers and sisters in the church, if your children have been hurt here, I am sorry. Having said that, you, like me, would burn down the kingdom to make them happy. You love them so much. You want them to love God so much. You want them to come back. You might even say things are different now. But their experience has not readied them to walk back through those doors and face whatever it was. 
And in your desire for them to be accepted, you would burn it all. All the conviction, all the clarity of Scripture. Don't do it. Don't do it. Love them. If you have issues in this church, you have got to talk about it. You've got to pull people aside. You've got to. I know you don't want to. I don't either. We've got to. We've got to fight for this. We can't compromise. Don't do it. It helps me when I remember the story of Zane forgetting his shoes. Because it reminds me that I've done just as bad a job raising my children as how my children have been treated in the church. When they tell me how they get looked at because they're my kids, the fishbowl that that is, sometimes I wish I'd never chosen this job. I, I know you do. I don't think it's intentional. I'm just telling you, we got to work it out. We got to work it out. If this is your personal or your parental struggle, you need to leave here making decisions that you will not compromise your conviction because of persecution or because of difficulty. You won't burn down the kingdom because of the pain that you've experienced. There is another way. It is the Jesus method. Some of you in the church, talking to a different group now, you have done this. You have hurt people. Knowingly or unknowingly, intentionally or unintentionally. And you do it in many ways that you don't realize. You do it in ways that you think you're standing up for what's right. No, there's two genders and only two genders. You might be right. Who cares? When people feel the way they feel when you talk about them or to them, does that communicate leaning in and trying to understand anybody? What in the world are we doing? The things that we post on social media as if nobody's looking when the whole world is watching. Don't do that. Brothers and sisters, someone may be coming to talk to you this week. Can we talk? You did some things or said some things and we need, we need to talk. And by God, I hope you're ready. I hope you're humble. I hope you're not defensive. I hope you will listen and not try to argue your point. We're not talking about your rightness here. We're talking about leaning in and loving people. If you do the latter without doing the former, the gospel disintegrates. Finally, to all of us, love your neighbor. If you're reaching out to your unmarried friends living across the street from you to have them over for dinner, to hopefully have them into a Bible study, but the gay couple that lives next door you want nothing to do with, you are missing something. We should be, we should be called a hate group by the world because we say marriage is, is for, for, sex is for marriage only. Everyone's doing that, but we get fixated on this thing right here. If you're gonna be offended, then be offended by all of it. But it just shows that we don't see sin the same. 
We don't take pride as seriously. We don't condemn greed as loudly. Because we don't talk about what we make in the world. That's rude. We talk about it here. Hospitality is a biblical command. And what I heard in the testimony today was that hospitality makes a massive difference. We need to be hospitable. When someone comes into the church and they have a clear issue, I don't know, they're living together, they shouldn't be something like that. The first thing that you do when you sit down with them is not, you need to move out. <laughs> you build a relationship. You get to know them, I hope. That's what we do here, okay? The first thing that you do is not to call them out on this thing that is right in front of your face because you're uncomfortable. Jesus leaned in to uncomfortable people and uncomfortable situations because he was clear, it's not the healthy that need the doctor, it's the sick, and we're all sick. We're all sick. We all need Jesus. And if we understand that, and we get that, and we know that, my hope is we'll be humble in how we treat other people. This is the beginning of a conversation. It's not the end. Maybe today you go, I'm not sure still about some of these things about gender or transgender or binary or non-binary. I'm not sure where I land yet. It's okay. I just ask you to continue to pursue figuring it out. Be active. Be active. There's a lot that we haven't talked about yet. That's fine. But, but let's be clear on what we need to do. We need to employ the Jesus method. Are you with me, church? We've got to love each other. We've got to love our neighbor. We've got to allow the gospel to offend others, not us. And we will do that when we really believe we're sick, when we really believe we're not perfect, when we really believe we don't have it all figured out, when we really believe it's not this political party or that one that's going to save us. But living in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Some of us were a little too upset this week by what happened on Tuesday. And that should be an indicator to you. You're a little bit too far into one kingdom over the other. It's the Jesus method that will solve the world's ills. That's it. You're going to discover that one decade. Let's conclude with this. We must, 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 must become experts in loving people who disagree with us. People have left this church this year because what we did or didn't talk about when it came to social justice, politics, money. And they went and found a church that taught what they wanted to hear. Let that not be you. Let that not be me. You're sitting next to someone probably that voted differently than you. You're sitting next to someone that probably looks different than you. We have almost 20 interracial couples in our church. I dig it. We're different. It's hard to love different. I love my teams, and you should too. I was a college soccer player and coach. All of my kids love different soccer teams than I do. Let me tell you the pain that this causes me. We're different. My wife chooses my teams. I appreciate that. What do you see when you see people? I'm going to close with one final story. I met a guy one time. He is a nationally recognized Hall of Fame soccer player. We became friends. I didn't tell him until later that in high school, I had his picture on my wall. Not his picture like, woo, but just a team and he was on it. He played in multiple World Cups, scored goals in World Cups. 
uh, played first American to play professional in Germany in the Bundesliga. What I saw when I saw this guy was like this legend, this hero, this guy that was on my wall in high school. We built a relationship. I got to know him. We became friends. We coached together in college. We studied the Bible. I did his wedding. All I knew about him before was a soccer hero, Hall of Famer, one of the best there has ever been. I know everything about his life now. I have his number, I call him whenever. What do you see when you see people? What labels do you use to put on people? If you see a label, you will never see what God wants you to see. And we want to be a church for all nations and for all generations. Let's bow and pray, and then our means going to come up. Father, we love you. Help us, help us, help us. I pray, God, that we wouldn't feel totally rebuked today. <laughs> but, Father, that we would feel a sense of righteous urgency to take with us what you want us. God, let this not be some intellectual exercise. We've got to leave here changed. Help us to be really, really clear on what that means for us. Help us to talk about it in the fellowship, in our small groups this week. Even I just pray, God, that we would go, man, I got to grow for your kingdom to be what you intended. Let us all be humble. Let us all take something from this. Let us grow closer as a family and a community and see many, many people become disciples as a result. We love you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.